Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next installment of the 2021 Virtual Book Talk series sponsored by the program in the history of the book in American culture here at the American Antiquarian Society. We come to you from the ancestral lands of the Nipmuc tribal community, a community that continues to thrive here in central Massachusetts. I'm Kevin Wisniewski, Director of Book History at AAS, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. With me is AAS Library Assistant, Amanda Kondik. Before introducing today's guest, I'd like to welcome everyone here today and for newcomers, briefly introduce the society. AAS was founded in 1812 by Patriot printer Isaiah Thomas. We are a research library and learned society located in Worcester, Massachusetts. We're devoted to understanding and sharing the history and culture of North America before the 20th century. As a library, we collect, preserve, and share the printed record of what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. Our collections include books and pamphlets, newspapers and periodicals, manuscripts, and the graphic arts. In addition to this virtual book talk series, we have a variety of public programs. We offer visiting research fellowships. And before the pandemic, we welcome scholars and readers from around the world to use our reading room to work on their own research projects. And we hope to do so again soon. Before I introduce today's guest, Amanda will offer a quick overview on the platform we're using today. Thank you, Kevin, and welcome everyone. The chat function is open, so feel free to send your comments to all attendees and panelists. Uh, throughout the presentation, I will also be posting additional information and links in the chat relating to our speaker, AAS and Fabek, and you should be able to save the chat by clicking on the three dots in the chat window. If you have any problems during uh, this program with your visual or audio settings, you can also message me privately in the chat. For the Q&A portion of the program, we'll be using the Q&A function located on the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have any questions for Melissa during or after her presentation, please type them in there. As attendees, you will also have the option to upvote your favorite questions by selecting the thumbs up icon, which we will get to at the end of the program. And finally, I would like to let everyone know that we are recording this program. So for those who would like to rewatch it, we will be posting it on our YouTube channel. So thank you, everyone. And Kevin, back to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, now to today's guest. Uh, today's guest is um, uh, Melissa J. Homestead. Uh, and today's talk will focus on her latest book, The Only Wonderful Things, The Creative Partnership of Willa Cather and Edith Lewis, published earlier this year by Oxford University Press. Melissa is Professor of English and Program Faculty in Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where she also directs the Cather Project uh, and serves as Associate Editor of The Complete Letters of Willa Cather, a digital edition. Her work on The Only uh, Wonderful Things was supported by a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. Her first book, American Women Authors and Literary Property, 1822 to 1869, published by Cambridge University Press, was supported by a Mellon Post-Dissertation Fellowship at AAS. And in fact, I'm pleased to say Melissa is a former three-time fellow here at the Society. So uh, Melissa uh, maintains an active research agenda in 19th century American women's authorship and publishing history. And she is the president of the Catherine Maria Sedgwick Society. It is my pleasure to welcome back to AAS, Melissa Homestead. So hello everyone. I just wish I were in Worcester in person. So I'm happy to be presenting virtually in this webinar sponsored by the program in the history of the book in American culture at the American Antiquarian Society from my kitchen table in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, and I will say that uh, my cats have been part of all of my virtual book talks, except I've just been away for a whole week for the first, the first time they haven't seen me around for more than a year. And they're a little needy and they're, they may disrupt things a little more than usual. We've got uh, Bessie here in my lap right now. So anyway, um, my talk will consist of two parts. First, I'll present a brief overview of my book, 
The Only Wonderful Things, The Creative Partnership of Willa Cather and Edith Lewis, chapter by chapter, accompanied by images. My book tells a story. It's essentially a dual biography and makes arguments. The arguments are relatively muted. It's more the story. Uh, and my most prominent argument is about the, tra the trajectory of lesbian history. Nevertheless, book history is my thing, as is the 19th rather than the 20th century, uh, which explains how I've been a fellow at the American Antiquarian Society three times. Um, thus, in my uh, initial overview, I'll reflect on some detail on the challenges I faced in recovering Edith Lewis's career as a magazine editor, a part of her work life that's essential to my argument about her role in Cather's creative process. I hope this discussion will interest those in the audience in relation to questions of method and evidence and theorizing editing that belong properly to book history. So there are two strands of my argument. Have I just been muted while I was doing this or wait, something just happened here. Hold, hold on. You were, you were muted, but you were unmuted now. Okay, so, sorry. So, you didn't hear the first paragraph of my talk yet. Okay, sorry about that. I've been doing a lot of these, but I think, anyway. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be presenting virtually in this webinar sponsored by the program in the history of the book in American culture at the American Antiquarian Society from my kitchen table in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, my talk will consist of two parts. First, I'll present a brief overview of my book, The Only Wonderful Things, The Creative Partnership of Willa Cather and Edith Lewis, chapter by chapter, accompanied by images. And she's being very disruptive here. This is Bessie. Uh, my book both tells a story. It's essentially a dual biography and makes arguments. The arguments are relatively muted. And my most prominent argument is about the, traje sorry, the trajectory of lesbian history. Nevertheless, book history is my primary field, really. Um, and the 19th century rather than the 20th, although of course this is a book about Willa Cather who's a 20th century figure mostly. Um, but after my initial overview, I'll reflect on in some detail on the challenges I faced in recovering Edith Lewis's career as a magazine editor, a part of her life work that's essential to my argument um, about her role in Cather's creative process. I hope this discussion will interest those in the audience in relation to questions of method and evidence and theorizing editing that belong properly to book history. So there are two strands of argument throughout my book signaled in my title by the phrase creative partnership. First, that as two ambitious career women, Cather and Lewis created a romantic and domestic partnership that allowed them to enjoy love and intimacy and to pursue their ambitions. And this is them in Jaffrey, New Hampshire in 1926. Second, that as an editor, Lewis was a partner in Cather's creative process uh, and also used her expertise in advertising to help craft Cather's image as an author. And this is um, a page from The Professor's House. My book starts and ends at the old burying ground in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, where Cather and Lewis are buried side by side. Um, by the end of my book, I think I succeed in undoing the mythology about the gravesite uh, that has obscured Lewis's place in Cather's life. Having started at the end with my own first trip to Jaffrey in the autumn of 1984, uh, my senior year of college, I turn back the clock and introduce Edith Lewis as the young woman Willa Cather first met in Lincoln, Nebraska in August 1903 at the home of Sarah Harris, publisher of the Lincoln Courier. This is the Harris house in 1903, although that's Sarah Harris's mother and brother, I believe in the picture. And this still stands in Lincoln, Nebraska. Sorry, uh, delving briefly into Lewis's New England family history, which stretches as far back as the Mayflower. I paint a picture of her family's life in Nebraska before she herself emerged into public view as an adolescent studying at the University of Nebraska. And there she is with her Delta Gamma sorority, the bottom right, um, and publishing her short stories in Lincoln Courier. She published a dozen short stories when she was 16 years old in a local paper. She transferred to Smith, where she met Oxa Barlow, an important character in the book, and this is Oxa, and from which she graduated in 1902. And here she is with her literary society in the back row. Chapter two follows Lewis to New York City, where she moved after a year back in Lincoln teaching school. Um, and this is 60 South Washington Square is on the left in this picture around the time that she moved there. I trace the growth of her relationship with Cather, both personal and professional, from their first meeting in 1903 through about 1918 in this chapter. 
from 1906, both Cather and Lewis worked at McClure's magazine. And I argue that the magazine office was the crucible of their collaborative work on Cather's fiction. And this is actually the earliest instance I have located of Lewis editing Cather. It's her editing a poem um, as it appeared in McClure's in 1911. I also argue that Cather and Lewis in choosing to make a home together in 1908 were emulating Sarah Orne Jewett and Annie Fields. And here they are in a very famous picture, Jewett's on the left, Fields is on the right uh, in their home at 148 Charles Street in Boston. Um, and this couple is identified by most scholars as the prototypical Boston marriage. In any event, after Cather left McClure's, Lewis moved on to Every Week Magazine and I recover Lewis's work as an editor of fiction there. I'll return to these subjects later, but here actually is an example where I see Cather and Lewis uh, in conversation in 1918 in a way. Uh, W.T. Benda illustrated My Antonia. Uh, Cather worked closely with him, and that's an illustration of Lena Lingard, a Swedish immigrant knitting while watching her family's cattle from My Antonia on the right. And on the left is a story that Lewis commissioned for every week, and it was illustrated by Benda at exactly the same time, and he's using the same model. You can even see the way that the dress is exactly the same. In chapter three, I turn back the clock to 1915 to tell the story of Cather and Lewis's four shared trips to the US Southwest. Here they are in 1915 at Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde. Throughout the book, Lewis's editing of Cather's fiction is a key theme. Oops, here we get that. This is actually a map of their trip in 1915. And here we have the professor's house again. But I linger over the evidence here because the first surviving edited type draft of one of Cather's novels is The Professor's House, published in 1925, which was grounded in their 1915 and 1916 Southwestern trips. Their travels in the Southwest in 1925 and 1926 inspired Death Comes for the Archbishop, and here they are in 1925 in New Mexico. Although there is no type draft of this novel, there's a rich record of their travel and literary collaboration. After mining the record of their experiences together in the desert Southwest, I focus in chapter four on Lewis's career as an advertising copywriter at the J. Walter Thompson Company, arguing that her advertising copy for soap and hand lotion and cabbage fiction are in conversation with one another. And here is actually one particularly interesting instance. It's a Cather story serialized in the Woman's Home Companion on the left. And on the right is an advertisement for hand lotion, Jergens lotion, um, that Edith Lewis wrote the copy for. I also hypothesized that Lewis was behind the famous Edward Steichen portrait of Cather published in Vanity Fair in 1927. Lewis worked extensively with Steichen on advertising campaigns. And so Jergens lotion, again, um, if you look, both the photograph of women, a woman's hands kneading dough and Willa Cather just say Steichen underneath them as a credit line. Lewis started in advertising in 1919 and she and Cather first summered on Grand Manan Island in 1922. You may recognize these pictures from uh, the book jacket where they're sort of photoshopped to look like they're in the same picture, but in so many of the pictures that I found of them, they handed the camera back and forth rather than having a third party photograph them. I devote a separate chapter to their many summers there, both before and after they built their own cottage at Whale Cove. And here this cottage is, and uh, Edith Lewis hand colored it with watercolor, the photograph. And at the top in Cather's handwriting, it says, this is our little home. Cather has been portrayed as living in isolation on island, but she was living on the island, but she was living with Lewis, who actually owned the cottage and the land. Furthermore, at Whale Cove, they were part of a community of women, and only women. In this chapter, I focus on their collaborative work on the stories collected in the volume Obscure Destinies, and here is one of them, uh, Two Friends, which was published in 1932, and on how both of them responded to the deaths of their parents in the late 20s and early 30s. I also see them as moving past grief in the 1930s by inviting sisters and nieces to visit them on the island. And this is Cather on Grand Ann in the early 1930s with her niece, Mary Virginia Ald. In my last chapter, I take them, take them back to New York City where they settled in a large apartment at 570 Park Avenue in 1932. In 1927, they had lost their Greenwich Village apartment to subway construction and camped out in an apartment hotel for five years before leasing another apartment. They made their lives together there and built relationships with each other's families and with the Menuhin family. So Yehudi Menuhin, the violinist, his sisters, Hepzibah and Yalta, and their parents, Moshe and Marutha, all of them. 
Both Cather and Lewis also died in this apartment 25 years apart. Appropriately, Lewis's profound grief at Cather's death occupies a significant portion of this final chapter. The years after Cather's 1947 death correspond to the Cold War panic over homosexuality. Oops, there we go. Uh, Cold War panic over homosexuality called by one historian, the Lavender Scare. In my epilogue, I consider how this context enabled, context enabled some to deny Cather's lesbian sexuality and to refuse to see Lewis for what she was and what she had been in Cather's life. Okay, here we go. Um, as the images of marked up typescripts I've flashed several times uh, on the screen make clear, Edith Lewis substantially shaped Cather's work as her editorial collaborator. I find these documents endlessly fascinating um, and carefully chosen examples and what the documents reveal are woven throughout my book. So here are some more professor's house. Here, they sort of did arts and crafts uh, in interesting ways. This is actually two different versions of Shadows on the Rock, um, but they are, even though they're sort of put together in slightly different ways, they are actually identical in the end. So they were making sure they had copies as spares, which probably meant that they were on Grand Manan Island. They even pasted identical scraps from a cheap religious pamphlet so they get all the diacritical marks uh, put in correctly. Um, and here we have, uh, we have more. We have uh, neighbor Razaki on the left, Edith Lewis doing some quite substantial editing, but also um, Willa Cather's handwriting. Now that ed editing is collaboration, like I said, has always seemed obvious to me. However, even though many, if not all of the currently known edited typescripts of Cather's work have been available in libraries for decades, um, the world of Cather scholarship has, or was for the most part, resistant to acknowledging that Lewis was doing anything but taking dictation, which makes no sense, or copying over things. On the right-hand side, we have uh, two parts of two, um, versions of the same paragraph and the story, Two Friends. And I actually worked out that Willa Cather was copying over Edith Lewis's editing rather than vice versa, again, to make sure that they had the work preserved before it was sent from Grand Manan Island to New York. Nevertheless, even with my disposition to see editing as collaboration, I felt it was important to understand what experience and authority Lewis brought to this collaboration. And here we have her, you can see um, on the one hand, uh, and this is um, Lucy Gayhart, we have a note that shows her being kind of more technical. She's got a note to the copy editor saying, um, only put the accents in when we put them, we have a reason. So don't standardize things. And on the right, she's actually making a, a lovely substantial change to the text that um, is part of my chapter six. So here though, like I said, I wanted to um, find out what she was doing, right? What authority and expertise she brought to collaboration and went to her magazine editorial work um, to figure this out. And the magazine editorial work is before the first document, uh, the first novel, as I discussed, The Professor's House, that happens to survive. Obviously there were typescripts of all of the worker, the earlier work, and Lewis almost certainly edited them as well. The challenge I faced in recovering, challenges I faced in recovering Lewis's magazine editorial work may be familiar to some of you. Considering how few magazines left behind anything like complete editorial archives, how do we know what editors did on a day-to-day -day basis? And considering that many magazines did not print mastheads listing editorial staff at this time, how do we even know who carried out mag magazine editorial work if there is no editorial office archive? Of course, many magazines featured signed editorials, but is writing editorials editing? And what about the amount of unsigned content in the voice of the editorial we found in many magazines? In her memoir of Cather, Willa Cather Living, Edith Lewis briefly mentions that she herself worked at McClure's magazine as a proofreader while Cather was on staff there. However, her memoir is not about her life, but about Cather's life. Looking at McClure's magazine itself, available here in garish color through the Modernist Journals Project, if anyone wants to look at it. We can see that the officers of the corporation that owned the magazine are listed, including S.S. McClure. However, no other editorial staff is. At the time this issue was published in 1910, Willa Cather was the managing editor of the magazine. That's pretty clear, although exactly when she became managing editor is a little hard to figure out, but her name doesn't appear anywhere in this issue although her name did appear with stories and poems published in other issues of the magazine. Edith Lewis's name appears nowhere in McClure's ever. 
full stop, even though she worked there from 1906 to at least 1914. Furthermore, there is no editorial office archive for the magazine, only S.S. McClure's personal papers. These include some office editorial material, but less than one might expect, because when McClure lost control of the magazine bearing his name in 1911, it carried on without him. A number of Cather's letters working as editor, so being a professional editor, are locatable in library collections because some contributors to the magazine uh, donated their papers to libraries and because Cather soon became famous enough as an author for people to save her letters and for libraries to call out her name in catalogs and finding aids. Nevertheless, I found odd fragments of Edith Lewis and S.S. McClure's papers um, in addition to this edited Cather poem that I'm displaying here again. After McClure was ousted, Cather, who was herself, uh, who herself had just decided to leave the magazine, ghost wrote McClure's autobiography for serialization, a ploy by those who had taken over to maintain the illusion that McClure is of uh, McClure's continuing involvement. When many people wrote to magazines, uh, wrote to the magazine in response to the memoir, Lewis was in charge of selecting letters for publication as a sort of sequel as evidenced here by a fragment of correspondence with Edith Wyatt, a McClure's contributor. She was on the cover of the magazine that we just saw, Working Girls Budget, who was hired to help with editing and permissions. On the left is a letter addressed to Miss Lewis about Mr. Houston's letter to be published. And on the right, a typed copy of that letter, uh, getting ready for publication that shows editing in both Wyatt's and Lewis's hands. And then there's the fact that in many instances, letters from the magazine office went out from the office as a whole, with no name attached. As the world's leading authority on Edith Lewis's handwriting, because somebody has to do that, right? I happen to know that both of these letters were signed by Edith Lewis as editor of McClure's magazine. On the left is a letter to a lawyer um, seeking advice about a McClure's contributor who had gotten in trouble reporting on the Mexican border in 1911. And on the right is a letter on McClure's uh, behalf after his ouster in which she took care of a personal matter. Uh, no, he wasn't going to join the Philippine Society. Fortunately, I had access to two more documents that fleshed out Lewis's career in magazines for me and got me started on a breadcrumb trail, both in relation to McClure's and to every week. First, here's a card kept by her Smith College alumni class secretary, and I say a lot about the companion Willa Cather 1931 part in the introduction to my book. But here, the point is, is that it alerted me that she left McClure's for Associated Sunday magazines in every week. And if anybody's interested in the technicality, I can tell you the relationship between those two entities later. Second, in Elizabeth Shepley Sargent's memoir of Cather, she makes a passing reference to the fact that Lewis worked at the J. Walter Thompson Company. As it so happens, this advertising agency kept a robust archive that ended up at Duke University. Here are portions of her 1918 job application after every week went out of business. As Lewis explains of her time at McClure's, I was successively proofreader, makeup editor, art editor, literary editor, and acting managing editor. Indeed, these small cues led me to discern that Lewis was art editor in 1910 um, when this McClure's issue was published. As managing editor at Every Week, but back here, uh, she credits herself with a more interesting and lively makeup, caption writing, and managing the rotogravure section, among other things. She also specifies that Mr. Buckley, president of the Crowell Publishing Company, can provide a reference. So they called him up, and here's a record of the phone call. I mean, this is stuff that you can really find. It's wonderful. Uh, Buckley says Lewis was a very fine executive and good on detail and follow-up that she had a very fine mind, really a brilliant mind, that she was one of the best judges of fiction they had ever known, that she had rewritten a great deal of the stuff that had come into them. Well, this was certainly a wonderful thing to find, and I found it just a few years into my 18 years of research and writing that resulted in my book. However, where could I find concrete evidence of what Buckley describes here, which is rewriting stuff, which sounds very much like what she did to Willa Cather's fiction. Every Week magazine was a three cent weekly with a high circulation, and like McClure's, it left behind no editorial archive. Yet again, only the editor in chief had a public face of the magazine. Uh, so Bruce Barton was the editor in chief. This is before he founded the ad advertising agency, before he became a congressman. No masthead, as we see here, an editorial, uh, just Bruce Barton as the editor-in-chief being Bruce Barton. Are you a good advertisement for yourself is the subject of his editorial. 
Nevertheless, his personal papers at the Wisconsin Historical Society got me started. Uh, there are only a few items from the very end of the magazine run. When wartime paper shortages and a drop in advertising revenue shut the magazine down. Fortuitously, one of the, these items was a letter from a contributor who later gained fame and prestige, Conrad Richter, then early in his career. He lamented the end of the magazine and asked Barton to pass along thanks to Miss Lewis for her interest in my humble scratchings. His personal papers also helped me to find other magazine staff members, um, sorry, Bruce Barton's papers helped me to find other magazine staff members, including Brenda Eulen, who has a lively portrait of every week magazine office life in her memoir, Me. And there were a few more nuggets in Eulen's papers at the Minnesota Historical Society, but I digress. Uh, back to the fiction writers who contributed to Every Week magazine. Richter was important enough for Princeton Special Collections to acquire his archive. There were quite a few letters from Edith Lewis in his papers, giving advice and guidance, um, and often doling out rejection. Here in 1915, after Richter had one story rejected, undeter undeterred, he tried again. Lewis wrote him at length because the story had interested her more than the general run. She conceded it was a very unusual and original piece of work, and the idea was extremely original and interesting, but his power of execution was not nearly adequate to his idea. Likening Richter's story to the type of thing in which uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne succeeded so wonderfully, she found that Richter's lack of, lack of technique blurred his flashes of real inspiration and imagination. As a marketable product, she explained, returning to a pragmatic register, it does not stand as good a show as a story with a more commonplace idea that lies within the writer's power of presentation. Interested was a key word when Lewis corresponded with potential contributors of fiction, at least the couple that I have found the correspondence. Um, in some instances, it signaled a willingness to buy. We are interested in purchasing your story. But in others, Lewis was interested in an aesthetic debate. In the latter case, she wrote in the first person singular, um, not as we, often sort of pretending to be herself and Bruce Barton, although I think it really was just her often, um, indulging in a longer epistolary exchange, but she, sorry, get back here, but she knew better than to open every week's purse to fiction that didn't suit its audience. But most contributors were not Conrad Richter, the sort of audience whose papers would find a home in a library. And even in the case of Richter's papers, Lewis's name does not mention a merit in the Princeton Finding Aid, although Bruce Barton's does. One of the enduring mysteries of every week that I would dearly love to solve is how Susan Glassbull came to publish two stories in the magazine, including a jury of her peers, a short story version of her early Provincetown players one act trifles. Um, this is the ad stripped end of the story, which I have up here because it has some interesting textual differences from the best stories of 1917 volume from which it is widely anthologized. Um, and it's the end of the story that's different as well as some interesting illustrations. I think it's interesting that our murderous farm wife is actually depicted because she is never visible in the play. Um, and if anyone wants to poke around uh, in every week magazine and see the story, um, I produce this digital edition with my Center for Digital Research and Humanities at everyweek.unl.edu. And even though Lewis's letters to Richter present a rich site for recovering uh, one aspect of her editorial work, Right. She articulated the magazine's program for Richter, gave him advice on revisions to meet that program, and debated aesthetics with him. However, Richter's papers don't include edited drafts of his early stories. Furthermore, none of Lewis's letters to him suggest that she line edited his work for him. Richter's papers did include this 1917 letter on the left from Lewis to Richter about a short, short story program she was inaugurating in every week. The editorial matter published with the first story in the series, uh, you may recognize the illustration at the bottom, gave me a clue. So here, Edith Lewis selected letters from authors that she had sent letters to and the responses to the idea of writing short, short stories. So this prompted me to search for papers of those whose responses are quoted. Again, popular magazine short story writers, their papers are often not preserved. Frankly, I was gobsmacked to find that the Beinecke had accepted, but only minimally processed, the substantial archive of magazinist Philip Curtis, including edited drafts of many of his magazine stories. Spoiler alert, even though there were edited drafts of his stories published in every week and handwriting on them, 
Um, one of them appeared to be close to Edith Lewis's hand. I ultimately determined that it was an earlier draft and not her line editing. Although it's also not Curtis's handwriting, somebody was editing for him, just not Edith Lewis, because this is just way different from the published version. But the handwriting is, it's a, really the same style. Um, I just looked back at it again and thought, that really does look like Edith Lewis's handwriting, but it's not. Nevertheless, Curtis's papers ultimately brought me back to the beginning of my hunt for Lewis's contribution to Cather's fiction, not visible in the line edited drafts. Uh, the face-to-face -face conversations between the two women as Lewis reacted and gave advice without picking up her pen. So first, two letters from Lewis to Curtis about his first story to appear in the magazine, The Patrician, uh, the one that I just showed the edited type draft of. In the first letter, Lewis explains the character of the revision she pro proposes Curtis to make to the story. In the second, she congratulates him on how well and how quickly he executed them and closes her letter by saying, I was one of the editors at McClure's at the time we published your Princes and Plumbers, and I have always remembered your work with much pleasure. I hope you are going to send us a lot of good stuff for our new weekly. As I mentioned, Curtis's papers are stunningly complete, including a treasure trove of letters from various magazines accepting and injecting, uh, rejecting his work. And if anyone just wants to see a bunch of early 20th century magazine rejection letters and analyze their rhetoric, this is the place that you would want to go, um, including these two 1911 letters signed editor of McClure's magazine in Edith Lewis's hand. In January, on the left, she accepted Princes and Plumbers and told him to expect a check for $150. In October, on the right, she regretfully declined another story because they were overstocked. When Lewis wrote the second letter, Willa Cather was on leave from McClure's so that she could focus on, focus on wrapping up her first published novel, which would be published serially in McClure's in 1912 under the title Alexander's Masquerade and published by Houghton Mifflin in book form um, in uh, the same year as Alexander's Bridge. Cather contributed some nonfiction of McClure's over the years, as well as one nonfiction essay to every week, However, she left magazine editorial work behind and crafted an image of herself as detached from the market. Lewis remained in the hurly-burly of the magazine office, immersed in the commercial, uh, commercial aspects of literature as she wrote advertising copy and soap and hand lotion, even more commercial than being a magazine editor. In both contexts, Lewis's labor was invisible because structurally speaking, magazine editing and advertising copy generally are, at copywriting generally are invisible. Nevertheless, I also tend to think that it suited Lewis's personal disposition, her reserve and her shyness to be invisible. But I also think that invisibility can be pleasurable and can be a site of power. In a broader sense, by recovering Edith Lewis's magazine editorial work and advertising copywriting as taking place concurrently with her editing of Cather's fiction, I trace the intermingling of aesthetic ideals and commercialism in both of their careers as editors and writers. Thanks. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of the menu bar uh, on your screen uh, is open for those who would like to submit uh, questions. Uh, and as Amanda uh, noted at the beginning, you uh, as attendees can upvote uh, questions that you'd like to see at the top of the queue. Uh, Melissa, while we're waiting for questions to arrive from our audience, I have a, uh, a few questions myself. Uh, I'd really like to actually start uh, with the beginning of the book. Uh, in the introduction, you start uh, by talking about uh, being a senior in uh, you know, undergraduate studies and discovering Cather and rushing to the library to buy these uh, you know, books that are on sale. Um, and you also write elsewhere in the book that as a college student, you actually gave up on Edith Lewis. Uh, so my question, just to kind of get things started, is what first attracted you to Cather? Uh, how has that evolved? Uh, your relationship with Cather evolved over the years? And ultimately, what motivated you to return to Lewis for this book? Uh, well, um, my favorite high school English teacher, um, I won't go into all the details, but I needed to find an early 20th century author for a college admissions essay. And I was like, what? 
And so uh, Mrs. Judith Reese, my junior American literature English teacher said, um, uh, you should read Willa Cather and Edith Wharton. I think you would like them. And I skipped the Edith Wharton part and I went to the Bethlehem, Pennsylvania Public Library and checked out my Antonian O Pioneers and read them like I stayed up all weekend and like didn't sleep, just read them and I was just, um, and so I was hooked. Um, and I went off to college thinking that I might write an honors thesis on Willa Cather and I did. Um, and I became a somewhat obsessive reader in particular of my Antonia. I lost count a long time ago about having read it about a hundred times, um, more than a hundred times, but when it was about a hundred times. Um, but the thing about it is that when I went back to grad school, I became an antebellum Americanist somehow, which is the only field I had never studied except in high school English. Um, and I would just go to Cather conferences for fun. Um, and I was sort of, you know, hooked in by the whole Edith Lewis question because she went to Smith and I went to Smith. Um, but I would say that my, you know, even though I have now done all this work and I'm, you know, deeply engaged in editing and, you know, annotating Cather's letters and in the middle of a project to apply for a grant to digitize her manuscripts, um, I have a, I still have a very complicated relationship with her because I work on popular women's fiction from the 19th century and um, uh, she's the exceptional woman who, you know, rises above the meretricious trash of popular women's fiction. That's the way she positions herself. That's the way she still appears in literary history. Um, and I value work that she helped to devalue. So I, I have a very complicated relationship with her. Um, and I would say that my attraction to Lewis was the, the challenge of the hunt and kind of contrarianism. If people told me there was nothing to find, I was just determined to find it. And, you know, so that's, that's basically how that happened. But also, I mean, from the beginning too, I mean, I knew that Lewis was her, um, her executor and, you know, I've written on copyright. I used to be an intellectual property paralegal. Um, the edited typescripts were out there and I heard people talk about them. And that appealed to me as someone who is interested in the history of women's authorship. So that also brought me back to the work. Mm, lovely. You, you mentioned evidence. I wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit as well, because as historians, you know, evidence is a very important part of our research and how we interpret history. Uh, it plays an important part in your book in confronting Cather's sexuality, as well as Cather and Lewis's relationship, as well as making visible the role of authorship and Lewis's editorial role. Um, now, you've shown us some drafts uh, of, uh, uh, from Cather's uh, today, um, but you've also noted some of the limited nature or the total absence of materials uh, from you know, editorial archives uh, like McClure's. Uh, and there are no known like letters that exist between Lewis and Cather. So one, one letter, there's one letter, one letter, five <laughs> postcards. Okay. And the letter is beautiful. That's where the title of my book comes from. Right. So yes. So so could you talk a little bit more about uh, going beyond the the hunt that you talked about today, and and really kind of uh, dig a little deeper into how the evidence that you found really gives more insight into the relationship between Cather and Lewis. Well, I think that the, the one letter is, um, it kind of has echoes of the absent archive, um, uh, the epistolary archive that once existed. It tells you something about what was probably written before. Um, it also, I mean, they did spend time apart, but they also lived together. So I'm not sure that we should look for uh, big epistolary archives when people live together. Even think about, you know, one of the, you know, the Abigail Adams letters back and forth with John Adams, right? That's because he was off, you know, founding a nation and she was stuck on the farm. Um, so that's where you end up with big archives of letters. Um, so I just kept, um, I mean, I, I think I, I had a very seat of the pants um, approach to, well, if there isn't the conventional thing that you would expect, then how else do I get there? You know, where do I find things? Um, and I just kept going around back doors and hunting around and um, putting everything into chronology and then seeing where it could get me. So, yeah, I mean, I, there is a great mythology about letter burning. And I just had an article come out in Tulsa Studies and Women's Literature in which I explained in tedious detail 
um, why I don't think there was a regular practice of letter burning and that we can't presume that Catherine Lewis burned letters to hide something, which is um, what the presumption you will often see. So I, I have a follow-up to that as well, because you, you tell this absolutely beautiful story. And one of the things that really caught my eye as, uh, you know, as I'm going through the book is uh, the gift giving between uh, Cather and Lewis. And you describe the series of books that are exchanged as gifts between the two throughout their lives. And um, I was wondering, you know, this is a very specific question, but, but you list, you found all of them or a great deal of them. I was wondering if you could maybe talk about that ex you know, exchange of gift giving and, and what that shows about these two women, uh, uh, both as, uh, uh, in terms of their relationship, but also in terms of their individual aesthetic tastes and maybe how that even evolved over time. Uh, well, most of the, <laughs> the gifts that I found and talk about are from early in their relationship. Right. Um, so, and the first book that I found in a library uh, was uh, the copy of uh, Sarah and Jewett's Mates, uh, Made, Made of the Daylight to Friends Ashore um, that Cather inscribed to Edith Lewis, Christmas 1908, which is when they just started living together. Or they'd taken their first apartment together. Um, and as the only time when I opened that book and looked at it, and I'm a big Jewett fan too. And the only time in my life I've ever felt like I might want to steal something from the library. It was just so perfect. I was <laughs> like, oh, I'll steal this. Uh, but there's actually, I mean, so um, a, a lot of what I really talk about is that they were both sort of being serious about aesthetics, right? And there's, there's Henry James, there's, right. um, you know, there's, uh, who's that wrote modern painting, George Moore, there's, or he a novel by him, there's, um, oh, there's Children of the Ghetto, right? So literary realism, right. um, uh, Poe, Poe's poetry, that's another one. The Jewett stuff though is really speaks to my heart and that's about the relationship. But I will say that what's interesting is that I kept finding those and inscribed um, inscription copies and association copies are not often cataloged in ways that make them findable. Um, and it's also actually, um, sadly, a testament to the fact that when Eve Lewis was very old and incapacitated and had a nurse who worked to socially isolate her to gain control of her finances, that's how the, a lot of those books were dispersed in an odd way. And I kept running into them even late. Like there's a big collection, a big collector's collection of uh, women's history and literature stuff at Duke that I forget who the collector was who donated this very large collection. And um and they're just beginning to process it. And, you know, those books got out onto the market when they shouldn't have, right? And so that's why those books are oddly dispersed around is this nurse was taking things and selling them. Mm. So, but, so there are probably even more out there would be my point. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was a, that was a personal question. I, got, I kept thinking even at the beginning, uh, upon their first, you know, one of their earliest meetings, uh, I think, uh, Cather sends, uh, Louis uh, uh, Ivan uh, uh, Turgenov's on the eve, and I kept you know reading. Well, what does this mean? What was that? Er what were their early communications like? What were they talking about? Exactly, right, right, right. exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, we do have a question from Christopher Daly here, who asks, uh, "Do you see evidence that Cather's work in journalism influenced her fiction?" Um, there's plenty of work on Cather's um, journalism. I think that uh, and and you can find, you know, little scenes in her early journalism, like when she was in Lincoln, Nebraska, and she was a student and she was writing drama criticism. And there are little scenes that you can quite directly trace them to her fiction. And that work's been done for a long time. Um, I mean, more broadly, I think the idea that Cather was a journalist has been overstated because she was, you know, a cultural critic. Um, and then she was an editor of a monthly magazine. She did a rewrite and reinvestigation on the Mary Baker Eddy expose for McClure's. But I think she wasn't really a journalist, hardly ever in the sense that we tend to think of people being journalists, right? Like I said, she was mostly a critic um, and sometimes a magazine editor, so. Fantastic, thank you. And again, just a reminder to folks uh, that are attending that the Q&A is open. Um, uh, I do have another question regarding um, early in Lewis's career. Um, you mentioned in the talk earlier that while she was still uh, a student, she was submitting uh, short stories, but that actually continues uh, into a little bit later, 1904, 1905. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's easy to kind of simplify, you know, Cather as author, Lewis as editor. I think 
in the book, you tell this amazing story that, you know, actually kind of flips the story on its head a little bit and, and uh, the relationship is much more intertwined. But I was wondering uh, about Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did you ever get the sense uh, that there was any you know, competitive elements between the two early in their days? Because they were both writers, at least early on. Uh, and as far as we know, you know, Lewis never published anything after 1905, as far as we know. Except um, boatloads of advertising copy and anonymous editorial notes. Right. So do you know why she kind of gave up the poetry, short stories and, and shifted? Um, well, we don't we, we don't know exactly when she may have simply faced enough rejection that she gave up. There may have been other stuff she wrote. There almost certainly were many other things she wrote that were submitted and not accepted. Um, I mean, part of what I argue is there has been a sense that, you know, Lewis gave up everything for Willa Cather and she became subordinate in the relationship. But um, I, I really do tend to think that it was the total collapse of her family finances and the stress of that that caused her to choose a more pragmatic course um, that she certainly couldn't, you know, most young people in New York then and now, if they go there and they want to make it in the literary world, they've got they've got family support. And it was the opposite. Like she had to start sending them money because um, it was really just a, a total disaster and a come down in the world um, that happened because of, you know, the boom and bust of Western capital and everything. So, so I think that that's really uh, more of it. And I, and I also do seriously think that there is, um, I, I do feel like there is pleasure in the work of being the invisible hand mm -hmm. that, you know, that's just, you know, and there's also the sense too, you know, what if I have to make interpretive choices, um, uh, she has so often been denigrated and mocked um, when she's mentioned at all, you know, if there's a choice, I, I choose to give her uh, agency and pleasure and making whatever choice she made. Mm -hmm. If that's a possibility, that's where I go. Yeah, thank you. And actually, there's in your book, there's a lot of great examples of how uh, I think the two are working together on these early drafts that you have you know, a few pictures, I think, uh, in the book on uh, the professor's house. Uh, and really, uh, it shows kind of the ways in which Lewis really helps shape, you know, the language and style of, of Cather. Yeah, yeah. While she was being a magazine, while she was being at that point an advertising copywriter, where, you know, concision, everything has to be because every word costs money, um, which is a line in the professor's house and also, uh, you know, a, a truism in advertising. Uh, oh, somebody just asked in the chat, what did Kat Willa Cather die of? Um, she died of a cerebral hemorrhage, um, but in my book, um, uh, I tell a story that hasn't been told before about her breast cancer and mastectomy and um, metastatic breast cancer. It metastasized to her liver. Um, and I suspect that brain metastasis is what actually caused the cerebral hemorrhage. So that gives you a very different um, sense of Cather's life trajectory. Um, and also that Cather and Lewis kept this very, very quiet, you find no evidence of this anywhere. And I think they kept it from Cather's family. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that could be, um, but but it was um, the idea that Cather sort of lived in isolation and was a hermit. I mean, her health the last 10 years of her life was pretty brutally bad, mostly. And, you know, so that's late 60s into her late 70s. Um, and I think that accounts for a lot of this idea about her being sort of a hermit and withdrawn. She was just trying to keep as much of her energy as she could for working and for living um, without investing a lot of time and effort and other sorts of things that would please the public. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, in the talk as well, uh, you, you've mentioned, uh, as you do in the book, uh, Sarah Orrin Jewett and, mm -hmm. and her relationship with Cather a little bit. Um, in the book, uh, as well as in the talk today, uh, you created this, you know, little analogy between the relationship of Cather and Lewis with Jewett and uh, Annie Adams. Um, Fields, yeah, Annie Adams Fields, uh, yeah. Correct, yes, yes. thank you. Um, how did uh, Sarah Orne Jewett influence Cather's life, and how did she influence her, her art, her writing? Um, well, 
they only knew each other for a very brief time, but it's a kind of, um, you know, intense moment of mentorship, but it's also a moment of, um, you know, performance because Jewett is saying you should give up magazine writing. Um, and Cather is writing these letters explaining how she's so busy and so exhausted. She can't write, but they're kind of bravura performances of writing at the same time. Um, and then she didn't actually give up, um, magazine editing for another three years after she got that advice from Jewett. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think her turn, you know, her, um, turning to Nebraska regionalism, which she had done early in her career, but then she sort of turned away from it, um, in the fiction, say Alexander's bridge, which is set in Boston and in Europe. Um, so she turned back to Nebraska. I do think that, uh, Sarah Orrin Jewett inspired some of that. Um, and I also think that the example of Jewett and Fields' uh, partnership was very important to Cather in making the choice to, um, you know, set up a household with and make a commitment to Edith Lewis at that particular moment in her career. So, mm. while while I'm thinking about influences on on Cather's life and her art, um, I think I, there's a huge cast of characters in this in this work, uh, which are really colorful and interesting. But I think one character that I kind of wanted to mention just briefly and, and let you make of it what you will is uh, Greenwich Village, uh, uh, where they lived. And uh, they lived in this, you know, uh, spot which uh, it was called Genius Row. And I just kind of wanted uh, your take on how, uh, you know, kind of this American bohemian capital of Greenwich Village at the time maybe helped kind of foster uh, uh, their writing as well. Uh, well, I think certainly for um, for Edith Lewis, uh, you know, she gets very immersed in New York local color, um, as Cather calls it. She's her helping, showing her around local color uh, in New York. Um, and I think um, it's kind of a fulfillment of a bohemian fantasy that you can see in her early short stories when she was 16 years old. Um, I think it's also, you know, a, a cheap place to live still. Um, it's not really the Greenwich Village that it becomes when they move there. Um, you know, as Edith Lewis says in her memoir, it's a sedate bohemia. It's in the teens that it really takes off and becomes this national phenomenon. Um, and, and that's the point when they move to Bank Street. So they move off Washington Square, away, away from a lot of that to this sort of, you know, quiet street on the edge of the village. Um, but I do think that... Uh, Yes, they, they both enjoyed uh, the neighborhood. They could walk to work, um, which I think was also appealing. Um, and Edith Lewis had a lot of friends from college who were there. So I think it was um, certainly a kind of cradle for the relationship and for Cather to have someplace before she moved to, to New York that she visits Edith Lewis several times and uh, becomes immersed in that world. Um, and then also the kind of the adjacent arts. I really do wish I knew exactly all of the painters and um, illustrators that they knew uh, who lived in the neighborhood. There are some little hints of who they knew, but I think that's also kind of part of the bohemian atmosphere. Right. Um, if there are any other questions that folks from the uh, audience would like to raise, now is the time to add that. Um, um, I will uh, ask uh, uh, Melissa one final question. Um, this is a much more broader question. Um, I think that the book does a, a, an excellent job really uh, pulling out Lewis's work and, and really making visible what you, you know, referred to today as the invisible work, right? And um, I'm wondering uh, in terms of the you know, Cather's side of things, uh, What's one thing you think that a lot of folks get wrong about Cather? What's, what's something that, uh, you know, you, you hope to, you know, to remedy uh, about the way in which we remember her or her work? Well, I mean, I would say that uh, because Edith Lewis gets ignored, there is a tendency to think that she lives in isolation um, and that she's also, um, you know, unhappy. <laughs> that she's looking at a past, right? There's an earlier relationship with Isabel McClung, later Humbard, um, that Cather really lived in the world. Um, she continued to make friends. Uh, she, uh, she wrote to perfect strangers. You know, people wrote her fan letters. She didn't write back to everyone, but 
working on the complete letters of Willa Cather, you'll just find how many perfect strangers she wrote back to. I mean, she started getting a little pissy with people like, this is merely for you. I'm tired of you English professors wanting to publish my personal letters to you. She says that more than once because actually English professors would write and then be like, I'm putting this in a book on the subject of craft and fiction or something. And she'd be like, no, 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 that's, that's not it. And she wrote them, right? Somebody presented an interesting idea or seemed to have an interesting personality. She would write to them. Uh, she continued to make friends and, you know, that she lived, she lived a, a, a rich and happy life in partnership rather than being, um, you know, the, the queen of art, you know, isolated in her garret. Ah, lovely. Well, with, with that, um, we are going to wrap up our talk today. Uh, you can stay tuned. Uh, next month we have, uh, uh, an excellent talk with uh, Billy Coleman, who will be talking about his uh, his book on uh, uh, 18th and 19th century American music. Um, please, uh, uh, if you haven't uh, uh, purchased the book uh, already, um, there's a link in the uh, chat uh, for the only wonderful things. Uh, and I will just say that there's a, there's on the front page of my website, there's information about the discount code. If you don't want to give all your money to Jeff Bezos, you can use the discount code and buy it directly from the press. So you got it. And it's actually in the chat right now. So yeah, you, yeah. Uh, you can actually copy and paste that in uh, with that. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa, for joining us today. And oh, thank uh, you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everybody uh, for coming. I hope to see you back uh, again soon. All right. Bye.